Welcome to the Center of Light Radio with spiritual teacher, intuitive, musician, composer, and best-selling author of The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth, your host, Keith Anthony Blanchard. Coast to coast, pole to pole, all around the world on the internet, thanks to the marvel of technology. I am coming at you live from this little video guest house in Memphis, Tennessee. I am Keith Anthony Blanchard. You're listening to Center of Light Radio, Center of Divine Unfoldment and Reinforcement, Radio for the Soul and the Transformation Station. Big announcement, big announcement. Center of Light Radio is expanding. Always, of course. Uh, If you've been listening to Center of Light Radio for a while, you know that I spend almost all of my time creating and putting out an abundance of information to help one expand their life into greater degrees of bliss. Now, Center of Light beings, I want to provide you an outlet to plug into my RPM energy grid. I recently had a burst of light realization, and it was powerful. It brought me to a state of emotion by the marketing director for an hour. I, it was uncontrollable sobbing. That's why I knew. That's how I knew I was in alignment with something that was just truly overwhelming. It exploded and charged me with a passionate fire to share my heart through my matrix of creations and a current flow of ongoing empowerment. I have, listen to this, listening audience, I have been literally waiting many upon many years to lay it all out. My work, my play, my joy, my heart, and my life, and what that means to me, to my son, and to you. And here's how you can plug into my matrix of creations. Go to centeroflightradio.com and fill out the sign-up form, which will also give you access to my monthly newsletter. Basically, over a period of time, you're going to receive, check this out. You ready? Over a period of time, you're going to receive everything I have ever created for free. Talk about surrender and letting go. Because in this epiphany I had, it was declared, told to me, I felt it bones to bones that none of this belongs to me. It doesn't belong to me and I have no right to hoard it. So provided that it's not a hard copy of something, uh, anything that's electronic, anything that I do that is over internet, eventually once you sign up to this program on my website, that sign up form, you're going to get everything uh, as time goes by. What a deal that is. There is no better deal you can find anywhere. Yesterday and the day before, I had the blessed opportunity to spend uh, both days with Swamji Viswa Yogi, God Realized Man from India. Oh, dear Lord, what an experience it is with him. Um, And because of my filming these two events, uh, I'm putting together an educational documentary about humanity's future titled Love, Peace, and Unity. Be looking for that soon. As of next week, I'm going to be uh, airing on uh, Inception Radio Network slash Center of Light Radio. My interview, which takes place tomorrow, video interview, mind you, with Swamji Viswayogi. His theme for this year and the tour is titled Healing the Earth by purifying the water. Make sure you stick around because all the questions I'm going to be bringing forth are about water. Flint, Michigan, fluoride in the water, Fukushima, uh, BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. All these kinds of questions because we want to coincide and to relate to his tour, his theme that he is moving about the world, enlightening people and bringing unity together and um, supporting his cause. Let me tell you a little bit about my guest today, because it's now time to get down to Center of Light Radio business. If you want to call into the show, get dial 888 919 Again, that's 888-919-2355. Today, my guest is Scout Wilkins, and the show topic is Achieving Love and Optimism in a <whistles> Crazy World. Scout is a naturalist and systems thinker, an engineer and a builder, using these skills to explore the structure of human consciousness. She has been an adjunct professor of life sciences at ASU, professional development coach for the biomimicry professional program is a powerful life as a power is a powerful life coach and energy worker and a backcountry guide in southern utah's red rock desert scout says we are an amazing species poised on the threshold of profound freedom and unlimited possibility as we learn new ways to work with our consciousness she also says i have known from a young age what that feels like and then i fell out of touch with it my life path has been a quest to regain that sense of possibility and freedom. Her big question has been, what are the obstacles that we put in our own way? Why do we do it? And how does it work so we can do something different? I want to share 
what has worked for me, she says, in real world terms. You can find out more about Scout Wilkins at www.scoutwilkins.com. And that's S-C-O-U-T-W-I-L-K-I-N-S.com. Welcome to Center of Light Radio, Scout Wilkins. Thank you so much, Keith. I am so excited to be here, and I loved hearing your offer that you made. That's, um, you know, it is amazing to me the pace of the shift right now, the acceleration that's happening. Like you say, you just get these bursts of of insight or, or shift, and everything changes once again. And, um, so that was that was an amazing offer, and it's really in line with what I'm feeling too. It's just, it's just such a reality coming to this sense of oneness and, um, and just our our connection and the synchronicities and the serendipities. That was a really really beautiful offer, and I'm really here, really excited to be here talking my. My piece is really what does it take to do this in the real world? You know, I'm a very um, pretty grounded person. I grew up in nature. I uh, I took some flights of fancy out into the online virtual world, but brought myself back into my body. And uh, so now I'm just really interested in what do we do, you know, day to day to make the shift and not get caught up in the hopelessness that will take us down. I think that's that's the piece that I really want to speak to. So Scout, you came per request of a mutual friend of ours and I really like what you do. I like the setting that you do it in, in the, um, the Utah state. Uh, it's just really, really gorgeous. And today's show is about achieving optimism and, and this crazy world. And I know that we're using terms like crazy world because it is a crazy world. And of course, that's not out of judgment. We need words to describe what we see. Uh, we're calling a spade a spade. Of course, it's not out of judgment. But, you know, like you, I'm sure, like me, I'm sure you don't see the world as truly being crazy. Um, how do we begin to find our balance in such a place that can sometimes knock us off of our center? You know, you're exactly right. I do not see the world. as I mean, it can feel crazy and it can feel overwhelming and, and scary. And, you know, it's there's so much going on and there's so much to sort of pull us out of our center. Um, I think that I would like to start with a story to to describe what it is. I, I think that the biggest thing that we're we're lacking right now, I see that we are actually in this place where we're we're really shifting from one fundamental paradigm that we've lived in for all of time, ever since we became conscious, you know, this, this paradigm of scarcity and fear and separateness and seeing ourselves as separate. And we are in the presence of the shift into conscious connection. And it's, (laughs) it's a wild shift for our little beings that are used to holding ourselves separate and having these defined things. And here's my edge and there's your edge and and here's how we fit together or not. We're making a profound shift. And I think one of the scary things about it is we don't have a good way to talk about it or understand it between ourselves in this culture. Other cultures have a way of speaking about they they are more familiar with where we're going and i've been beginning to really reach into other traditions and find the word because most indigenous traditions have a word for this amazing place of connection and in navajo it's hojo it's walking in beauty and harmony it's their highest value and it's it's so much bigger than beauty and harmony so the story that i'll tell you about what is possible and remember these are human beings that this is possible for so this is the thing it's not like these others that are different than us right i mean this is this is one example of what is possible when you achieve this state of beauty balance harmony that is hojo when they 
weave their rug. A Navajo rug is an amazing thing. I've spent the summer learning a lot more. I, I just didn't know any of this before. But a Navajo rug, beautifully done, you take one corner. One of the ways that they can gauge the quality of the rug is they lay two corners together and peel it back. And the geometric outline lays back perfectly as you peel it. The geometry lays out exactly. So now the thing about this weaving process is that when they go, when the weaver goes to weave a rug, they haven't sat down with a grid and charted it out and measured it and laid it all out. (laughs) Right. They haven't done that. What they do is they sit down at their loom and they be just begin to run the longitudinal threads. And the way this is set up, there's no adding to this. If you run out of room, if you mess it up, you can't add to it. You can't subtract from it. You've got to know at the beginning how big you want it to be. You've got to know how wide. And then they start weaving with no, I mean, they have it inside. They have the image and they have... Pojo. And they sit here with their loom and they weave this incredible rug. And it is life flowing through them. It's the creation flowing through them. And so that's, I think that this is the piece that helps me to understand and to, and to just be willing to jettison everything that's between me and achieving something like that, because that's human capacity to be that open, that that level of creation can flow through. When you mention that story beautifully, um, as it is, it reminded me of the Tibetan mandalas that they create. It's the same idea of being in such a hyper state of presence, a hyper state of awareness, that you are connected to the cosmic dialogue. And when you're plugged in such a system like that, like the Tibetan monks or even the Native Americans or whoever they may be, um, you know, the imagery, the the body response to to the connection, you know, it's like I think it's I think it's Oriental. They when you become uh, a master in calligraphy or whatever it is, they have you draw a perfect circle, and you cannot quote graduate with the title or whatever the accolade may be until you freehandly draw a perfect circle. Same idea, and I think it's about as you said that we're all trying to get into this state of hyper awareness where the connection, our connection with the divine, is not just intermittently is just an ongoing, unbroken flow of presence uh, being in that state of who we really are, the essence. Yes. And what I would say about it is that what I have realized in the last couple of years, I mean, I've been working on this really, I would say all my life, obviously, but the last 10 years has, has been my absolute focus. And just in the last couple of years is when I have really come into hyper-awareness of the fact that it's just, I mean, it, it is mind, body, spirit, but the peace that, I mean, there are things to do with your thoughts and your awareness, your meanings, you're creating all that. That's, that's very important. And the really, the place where it lands is down here in your body when you actually feel the openness. It's a physicality that allows that to flow through. It's a physical openness. And once you, in my experience, once you one time feel that and realize what it is that you did to achieve that loosening and opening and relaxing. See, I see it as we're, we're too wound up for that to flow. And so it's a, it's a relaxing and it's so a letting go. So what is it that you now. did... To get, when you said it's realizing what I did to get there, what is it that you do to get you into that hyperspace? Well, like I said, there there are a lot of parts to it, but the one here's here's an interesting piece is that um, <laughs> I have dealt with a lot of anxiety in my life in the people around me. I had a very anxious father. I married a very anxious man. I raised an anxious son, and I carried the story that was 
oh, thank God I'm this paragon of peace in the middle of anxiety holding it all together. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, don't our stories crack us up. So in the middle of all that anxiety, I also suffered from tremendous depression. And, uh, you know, I mean, there were a lot of things going on. And a couple, well, there are two things I want to say about this story is that one, when I really started on my healing journey, my very deliberate healing journey and started studying NLP and started first really learned that I have an inner life and that I can do something about it and with it and really began to do that. My son, one of, I have two sons, the older one, we had had an incredibly challenged relationship most of his life. He was suffering from, at the time that I started into this path, he had been on an addiction path for probably 10 years. We were completely out of touch. Um, There were times I didn't know if he was alive or dead. And so I got to watch what I now teach is that when I began to lower my own level of anxiety and do do some work to bring a little peace into this system without any <laughs> zero contact. It wasn't like I was out there saying, okay, now I learned this, now I learned that. Okay, do this, do that. I mean, we there was no contact. But I watched him heal in step as I did. And that has been the most amazing part of this journey. So... Finally, a couple of years ago, I, I, I'm a seeker. I work with anyone, everyone. I've worked with uh, Guatemalan, Mayan shaman. I've worked, you know, just all over the map. I was working with an animal communicator in the UK, and he had this technique that's it's not unlike other, you know, bring it to center techniques, but it really worked for me. And what he had his his thing is a trust technique. It's James French, the trust technique. He's fabulous. But what he's teaching is how to bring your level of thinking, your level of anxiety, below the level of anxiety of the animal you're working with because your anxiety is spinning this animal out, right? So you got to bring yourself down. So the way he does that is something I teach now and use all the time is simply just quick, takes 10, 15 seconds. First, and it's, it's, you'll hear a similarity to somatic experiencing. You just look around. It, you, you orient yourself. You look around, engage your eyes, engage your vision, and then simultaneously with doing that, you, be, you pay attention to what you're hearing, and you expand that while you're also, so you're focusing on what you see and what you hear, in finer and finer detail, start hearing smaller and smaller sounds. And then you go, simultaneously with those two, you go into feeling. First you feel the external, like your sleeve on your arm. (laughs) I'm going to let you continue, but you reminded me of something I just recently put into practice as a technique. I'll tell you after. Please continue. Okay. So, but then as you do that, what happens is you're sort of using up all the bandwidth that was going to all that anxiety. And you begin to feel a relaxation inside. And the first time that I really went there with this was the first time I really got (laughs) the depth of the truth that me surrounded by all these anxious people in my life, what was true is that I was the most anxious of all. It was just that I was wound so tight And I had like a zip tie at the top that never let it stop. It was zinging. And this technique clipped that zip tie and I could feel the unwinding beginning. I could feel the unwinding happening. You can feel free. (laughs) You know, Scott, I've been using this technique. I did a presentation last month, August 6th, at the Metaphysical Fair. And it's something that came to me just prior to that. And it's part of my Radical Transformation Program, which is, I call it um, 
opening you up. And I would have someone gaze into me like you are, and I would tell them, whatever you do, do not take your eyes off of me. Use your awareness to take me in. And as you are doing that, become aware of the, the temperature on your skin. And I'll give them a moment with that. Now become aware of the taste in your mouth. I'll give them a moment with that. Become aware of any noises happening in the room. Become aware of the person sitting next to you. And then I'll point out to them how I directed your awareness to each of these focal points. But now what you do is you take all that in at the same time. And if you give a person a moment to, to, to sit with that, they begin to feel who they truly are to a greater capacity uh, because now they are peripherally aware and they somehow get opened up at least for a moment and they get the opportunity to step out of the box and outside of that box when they have that glimpse, you know, it's like using a weight. Here's a 25 pound weight. You keep exercising that particular awareness muscle and just like your body mass when you go to the gym and work out your awareness mass begins to grow and expand and as you begin to live in that space of expanded awareness if god is infinite awareness when we begin to expand our awareness it makes sense to me that miracles begin to pop out like fireflies in the night because now we can see now we can intuit now we can feel now we're open to experience the grandeur of that which creator our higher self is ready and has always been willing to give us exactly like exactly and the thing is the thing is, life is evolving us. We don't have to. We're not, we're not evolving into something that exists, right? Life is evolving us into something new that's amazing. And all we have to do is like, oh, I mean, this will carry us. And the minute you do this, uh, one of the things that happened for me that was so fabulous was that my sense of time shifted absolutely. I used to have this very clear timeline idea where there's the past and there's the future and here I am and I'm marching along and it it sort of circled around and became this moment that I'm in time right here and in this time right here I can actually shift things for myself as a child I can shift things for my parents I can shift things for uh, it's just and that begins to expand and there's just it becomes a, a visceral knowing that, that time is very different, very, very different. We have all the time we need because it's right here. It's a completely, and that's one of the huge pieces behind optimism is to get to that place knowing you have enough time. Because don't you think that not the fear of not having enough time or it being too late is like driving so much despair? I mean... And it's not true at a very weird level. It's just not true. So what does it feel like to be you, Scout, when you are in that zone, in that space of being in an expanded awareness? What does it feel like to you? I know what it feels like to me, but I like people oh. adding support. Right. Please go ahead oh. and tell the listening audience. What is um, it like? You know what I would say? I make a distinction between gratitude and appreciation because... I've dealt with so much resentment in my life, and this was another thing I wasn't aware of until just a few years ago. I had no idea how much resentment I had carried over what it was like to be born a powerful young girl in this culture. I mean, there's, you know, whatever that is, but to, to ask me to use gratitude as a tool did not work for me, because if I couldn't be grateful, I've, I... Um, what it is that I picked up more than anything was self-judgment, right? And so if I can't make gratitude work, then I can just, it gives me more fuel for my self-judgment and, you know. So I have found that if I let go of using gratitude as a tool and go to appreciation, it's like if it rains on a day that I've got to I get it, that. I thank you for that. I right? actually understand the shift, the small shift, but very powerful. Please continue. Huge, I do get huge. it. Huge, huge. Yeah, the, the appreciation can become a tool because there's nothing I can't appreciate. There's nothing I can't appreciate for what we're learning, for the part it brings, for the fact that I don't know. I don't know, but it's here. And so, it, you know, I can appreciate – I'm like I said, a systems thinker, and, and I get that you can't have this system, and even though you don't know what part that piece is playing, you take it out, you don't have this system anymore. So 
I use appreciation all the time, and I consider gratitude this incredible gift of grace that washes through me in the moments that I'm in that state that we're talking about. And so when I'm in that state, I am, it's like I'm just washed over with gratitude and love and awe. But there are just, there are not words for that, but it's, and it's when incredible things happen. It's like possibility is just there. It's just there. Let me ask you this, Scout. Because you've been doing this work for quite a while, and we, you're talking about being in gratitude and or appreciation, and you're getting washed, do you find yourself, uh, right now I need to be in gratitude or appreciation mode, or do you find that this is just a natural disposition for you now, a new default? Because for me, as a spiritualist, it's not that I'm ungrateful. I don't in fact, I, I never do go throughout my life. Well, so maybe sometimes I do, but but as as a normal way of living my life and processing my day, I don't go into these moments of being grateful or appreciation. I just live my life having fun, and I think that is synonymous that I'm on automatic pilot, living gratitude and appreciation by doing those things that bring me joy. Do you find that to be true for you? I'm finding it's beginning to be true for me. It, most of my life has not been true because most of my life I have lived in such profound self-judgment. And um, coming to terms with that and releasing that has been, <laughs> has been the freedom. Oh, it's, it's yeah. It, it, when we're going through it, it seems like that wall is 20 feet thick made of concrete. <laughs> but once we get through the other side, it's the the explosion, the, the releasing, the weight just falls off. From the chat room, I have a question from Don Daniel. He asked the question, he's wondering if Scout thinks our anxieties are worse from using cell phones and Wi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would say yes in that our anxieties are worse for being so busy thinking that we never turn off and just go sit and lean up against a tree and use our natural kin to help us chill the heck out. So, yeah, turn the, turn the cell phone off, turn the TV off. As far as, you know, the mechanics of the radiation and all that, I don't have an opinion. I, I think that, uh, you know, everything is energy, and the energy in those things, I believe, is spinning pretty fast, and everything I can do in my life to just chill the spin and be calm, be peaceful, be present, look the other person in the eye, uh, engage, you know, engage. The thing that happened for me 10 years ago when I started this path was I was so fed up with where I had gotten to, I just couldn't stay excited about an idea for more than a day at a time. I was so fed up. And I sat up. I didn't have a connection to my spirituality at the time, um, and so I don't even know who I was talking to. But what I said is, okay, this is it. I am not going to settle for this one more minute. I'm not going to settle for anything less than a fully engaged life. Whatever that means, whatever that takes, here's what I want. And I don't even know who I was talking to, but I sat up in my bed and I said this out loud. I want the work of my heart, and I want to be able to do it from wherever the heck I feel like being. And beyond that, I'm following. I rented out my house. I hit the road. I put a few little things in my car, and uh, life took me. And... So engagement, I think that that's my big piece is how do we get into these physical bodies of ours and engage with each other and with life and with nature and get out here and be excited and love what you love so much that nobody can keep you away from it and do that. Do that. <laughs> yeah. we, we live very parallel lives in that sense <laughs> because, you know, when you made that declaration, and you backed it up with passion, the fire, you know, roll up your sleeves and get your fingers dirty kind of thing. But you also use the sincerity, which is, I mean it. I'm very, very serious about this. What happened to you when you did that? The door just opened up, didn't it? It opened, right. <laughs> it opened. 8, 8, 8, and 9, I'll tell 9, you, 9, that, go ahead, go what ahead, that did is I, uh, I feel like I jumped 
across a chasm and, and grab this wall. And I spent about eight years hanging to this wall. And what I will say about that, first of all, you don't have to be quite that crazy. There's many easier ways to do that. It doesn't have to be like that. But while I was clinging to the wall, I never wished that I hadn't jumped. I didn't always know that I would survive it. I wasn't ever, I, many times, I, I, I don't know that I survived it, but I never one time said, I wish I hadn't jumped. Never. 888-919-2355, 888-919-2355 is the number you dial to get on the air with myself and my wonderful guest today, Scout Wilkins. We're talking about achieving love and optimism in a crazy world. Scout, would you give out your contact information so our listening audience can find out more about you and the powerful work you're doing to change people's lives for the betterment, not only of themselves, but to express and expand light in those around them? I will. My... Um my website is scoutwilkins.com, S-C-O-U-T-W-I-L-K-I-N-S.com. My business name actually is Traveling Light. I don't know if you knew that, Keith, but we have that in common as well. Yeah, Traveling Light, which, you know, I love to travel. And, and uh, as you said, I'm a guide in the backcountry. It's my favorite thing now. I, I love taking people out into nature and using what we find there as metaphors for what's happening inside them for it's just an amazing way to um to help and and the thing that i love more than anything that i will say is i love helping people feel safe and willing to explore territory that scares them or may even panic them i love being with people who are even terrified and help them feel fine know their okayness find their balance and it just doesn't get any better than that. Totally agreed. I live my life in the same way. I love being with people. And it's not, if I'm in your proximity and something's wrong, it's not that I want to fix you. There's a part of me that engages and just wants to see you happy and support, be it to give you a few words or to give you an ear, or whatever the reason it may be that I can be a support system for you. But I wanted to ask you, Scout, since you're living in the country and the mountains and the desert kind of energies have you ever went on the mountain in the native american way fasted going up there with some water maybe some gatorade for your electrolytes and no food and fasted just went up there and sat have you ever done that done a vision quest not a traditional vision quest but i have i actually grew up um I grew up in a natural history museum starting when I was 11 years old and started backpacking all summer, every summer when I was 12. And so I grew up with an incredible connection to nature. And that's my biggest, the connection to nature and also the, the capacity that was supported by the director of the museum and the other people there. It was just, I was raised in such an incredibly nurturing environment to just find my own connection and live it. Have you ever done a sweat? Oh, yeah. A lot of sweats. I've done a fire walk. I've, um, what is the you know, sweat like? Hot? <laughs> That's why um, you better be in prayer and meditation to get you through it. Oh, oh, I, I love doing sweats. Yeah. Actually, Keith, I'll tell you, the most amazing experience I ever had was actually not in a traditional sweat lodge, but was in what they call a vapor cave in Uray, Colorado. It's a cave down under this old boarding house. And it was a, a defining moment in my life. There's a, a pool of hot water. There's a lot of hot springs in Uray. There's one right in this cave. So there's a, um, a pool of hot water and then a little walkway and a bench. You're, you walk in through this sort of dank pirate ship curve door, travertine, drip, drip, drip <laughs> stuff. You know, and there's one little bare light bulb there. So you're sitting there and they ask you to maintain silence. I actually was by myself in the cave at this time. So you're breathing steam, you're sweating, there's water dripping off the roof. You can hear the water moving. There's You can actually hear a stream behind the rock wall, who knows where, some subterranean stream. And I had, and you're breathing in and out this vapor, and I actually had the experience of knowing with every cell in my body that I was part of the water cycle of the earth. I could feel the water in me 
going down the rivers to the ocean, up to the clouds coming through. It was, it was amazing. It's amazing. I know those spaces very well when there is no disconnect. You feel a connection to something that is alive so beyond we have always been used to. But in that reconnecting, isn't it strange, to use the word, how there is a familiarness to it? It's like, oh, my God, I forgot this part of the ancient me. Oh, it's coming home. It's a total coming home. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a total coming home. You know, the other thing that I'd like to say about that idea of hojo and, and connection and, and the opening is that I think that's what happens with a firewalk. When you stand at the edge of the fire and you're looking at this fire and, um, and you wait for the yes, you wait for the yes, and you know when it comes. And when it comes, you walk and you're fine. And it's the same thing that happened when uh, I read an article very recently, Alex climbed El Capitan no ropes, no protection, just climbed that incredible mountain. And he said, you know, people call him an adrenaline junkie. They've got all these words for him. It's, it's the exact opposite of what's true. We actually had a chance to meet him here and, and experience him as a human being. And it's, it is zero about the adrenaline. It's about the connection. And he said he walked to the base of that mountain 23 times asking for the yes. And on the day that he got the yes, he climbed the mountain. And I'll tell you, that is what's possible for us humans. That, that level of connection is possible. There's one thing, and I want to make sure I say this one thing. All we have to do is forgive. Unconditionally forgive everything that brought us to this point. And stand in here and now, because you can't go back and pick and choose what you're going to forgive, what you're going to let be okay. If you're carrying one strand of grudge, one strand of I can forgive everything except that, that is what's going to keep you from getting the yes from that mountain. And I'm sure when you get that yes... You know it. There's no second guessing. It probably no thunders in a very <laughs> silently thunders within and reverberates your being. I had a guest on my show on Center of Light Radio last year by the name of Frala Francis Tizo. And we were talking about rainbow bodies that when you ascend, when you graduate to the level, you no longer need your body. In that ascension process, in that moment, you obtain what's called the rainbow body. And I'd done some research a few days before so I can be prepared prepared for the interview. And what I learned is that in those Himalayan caves with those um, apprentices, those soon to want to be masters are doing, what they're doing in those caves every day, all day long, for many, 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 many years is healing things. They're going inside and forgiving themselves and others that have wronged them throughout their entire life. They sit in those caves and they forgive aspects of themselves. And so in our unforgivings, it is so laced with so many things, so many blocks and walls. It almost seems like, well, it's just a matter that you just don't forgive that scenario. I, I, I care to differ that it's so thick just in the simple unforgiving of one scenario. And you know how, how does one, let me ask you this, how does one begin to move through scenario with the person that they just find it, Scout, God, so doggone hard to let go. They want to forgive. I want to forgive John, Jane Doe, and my hand's on the switch, but I just can't find a way to do it. How do you suggest that? What do you, what do you offer? Well, it's not about forgiving John or Jane, is what I would say. It's just never right. about the other person. It's about forgiving yourself, and it's about, it's a little intricate inside because, you know, contrary to this attempt we make to be one unified being, we're, we're a bunch of parts. we got a, a gazillion parts in there, and it's really about just going in and doing some really deep forgiving. So if it's, if it's not about forgiving John or Jane, is it about forgiving the self because you're the one that harbored the resentment towards John or Jane in the first place? Is that the forgiveness that needs to take place? You know, the forgiveness that needs to take place is say, 
what the hell does it matter? Do I want to climb this mountain <laughs> right, or right. do I want to worry about who I'm going to forgive? Am I going to sort through all this stuff? I mean, there are certainly pieces to do. Here's, here's a piece that um, I will offer is that when you really go into appreciation and you really feel your way through what appreciation of the system means and you begin to look at the fact that, yeah, that thing happened, but there are actually some good things that came out of that. As much as I hate to admit it, there are some good things that have come out of our political mayhem that's happening right now. And I'm not going to put it at the feet of one person because we got political gridlock. We got people acting like two-year-olds on every corner, every aisle. I mean, it's it's I'm I'm going to say crazy. And there are good things that are happening from that. It's what needs to happen so that we will let some things go and take more personal autonomy. Here's here's the image that I like to offer in helping people think about this whole piece and and especially the forgiveness and the and the self-actualization is if you consider yourself as I'm, right now I'm, I'm drawing a circle sort of around my body with my arms, and you consider yourself in the center of this circle or oval, this what I would call cellular structure of you, your own cellular structure. And there is a natural edge to you, and it's defined by what you love what you're interested in, what you're passionate about. It's defined by what's part of you. And most of you knows this. Part of you denies part of it. And there are places where you collapse inward on some places and you overreach in others, right? So thinking of this wholeness that is you and making that your absolute top priority is building your own wholeness, your own beauty, so that there's no part of you that you're resisting. There's no part of you that you're rejecting. You just choose to own your wholeness, and then you deal with what that creates because you're going to find pieces of yourself that in codependencies you've let go of or you've taken on. I mean, there's a lot to do around that, but the decision is to own your wholeness and to honor your wholeness and to love what is inside you, which will lead you to see other people as whole. And you will begin, instead of fitting other people like puzzle pieces where you've collapsed in and they're overreaching into you and you're overreaching and they're collapsed in, you're actually engaging from wholeness. And at that point, the soup you're swimming in between you is love and you're transmitting love and mutual support and interest and curiosity and it all changes. You know, Scout, I, for me, the words I would use, maybe use it to this day, but my words that I would use back then was, I just didn't care anymore. I just didn't care. I didn't, I don't care. And it doesn't mean I don't care in the sense of giving up. I just don't care anymore. There's I totally nothing, hear you. There's I totally nothing, hear you. There's nothing I want upstream. So I just don't care about any of the ride, the amusement park. I just don't give a about it anymore. And so what I'm going to do now is what I want. Does that sound selfish? Maybe. Actually, I see it as self-full. And because of this shift I had some years ago, I am as blissful as a lark. I have it. It lives inside of me, you know, in the last couple of years, something has come inside of me and sit and live. And I begin to live in an expanded state of unawareness because of it. And now, Scout, I'm at the most blissful I've been in my entire life. I'm feeling most effective in the things that I'm passionate about, which is to be a support system for many people or anyone or just a friend. As you can tell, I'm a very approachable guy. I'm not really about, you know, make sure you contact my marketing manager or my account or my assistant. I'm not into that stuff. I like having fun and people are my joy. And it really shifted for me when 
when I made that simple declaration, like you said, you just have to make the decision. I made a decision that says, I just don't care anymore. It's just too much work to carry the, the cross of ignorance and pain. I'd rather carry the torch of enlightenment. It's just so much easier. I, I could not agree with you more. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. And I think that that whole question of selfishness is at the absolute core. I hope that people will go to my website and download my ebook, free, totally free ebook, that talks about this whole thing. I mean, here's, here's a piece, a story from nature about this selfish piece. I mean, we've got this idea and we've been raised and raised our kids in this idea, don't be selfish, whatever you do. Well, the most selfish thing is to outsource taking care of yourself so somebody else got to do it, right? But what happens in nature is that it isn't. It looks like a bunch of individuals out there scrounging and, and competing, but what actually happens is that when you have trees on two sides of a canyon, and there's one side of the canyon that in the winter gets no sunshine whatsoever, and they can't photosynthesize or they can't photosynthesize effect, you know, efficiently, you know what happens, Keith? <laughs> the plants that are in the sunshine produce, the, those individuals are producing vibrantly. They have become vibrant individuals because they were supported by the mycorrhizae in the soil that helped them to become the individual that can produce. And then once they produce an abundance, they dump it back into the mycorrhizal network and it's transported through the network, through the forest, not species-specific. It's not like pine trees are saying, go pine trees. It's just, <laughs> here's, we've, got, we've got stuff over here, help yourself. And so the young trees that are coming up are supported by this network. Then there is healthy competition so that you don't get too many trees. Some die out, some thrive. The ones that thrive dump their excess back into the matrix. It's a complete community of deep collaboration, which, yes, has a piece of competition in it, but that's what fills all the niches and keeps everything healthy and vibrant. It's, it creates the drive. It creates the passion. It, it creates the right. energy to want to get out there or in there, rather, and do something about the scenario. Right. So you follow what you love and you, you pour your passion into that. And when you do, the whole world benefits. If you're out there trying to just phone it in and you're trying not to be selfish and so I'm not going to, I'm not going to take this time and go do this. I'm not going to go follow my heart. I'm going to, you know, buckle down here, grow up. And, you know, I mean, how much passion is behind that? But when you say, you know what, call it selfish, if you will, but I'm going to just start guiding again, which I thought I couldn't do anymore. And I just, I'm loving my life. I'm reaching more people. I'm having more amazing conversations, making more difference, and we're all thriving. I've always said, if you, if you are not full inside, you're writing a check that will bounce at the bank. You can intend to write someone a check and have that check cashed, and it will not work. It will bounce. So what people may call or deem selfish in another person is the fact that they're possibly judging the fact that they're not taking the initiative to do what they love, and they're the ones who are wanting your or whoever's attention. I, I'm all about treating myself because now that I feel full inside, I have an abundance to share with those. And totally agree with what you said, Scout. When you trigger, when you live in that passion and have that gumption and that fire to do what you love, you become a wellspring in, like, you, like you explained with your son. You really didn't have to do anything to help him. Most people could see that a selfish scout is just looking out after herself. But as you did become self-full, when you begin to be so full that it was flowing over, he had no choice but to respond. Beautiful. So here's, here's what I would say about that. The rest of that story, I mean, one part of that story is that five years ago he got sober, and this year he had his first baby on the fifth <laughs> year of his sobriety. Oh my gosh, I'm going to see her tomorrow. So that's one part. But here's how I feel about that whole thing is that when I, 
when I'm sacrificing myself and judging myself and saying, oh, I screwed up as a mother, look at, look at, I mean, here's the proof, you know, my son's struggling so hard and it was me that blah, 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 blah. I've got this story. So what happens when you've got a story is you've got a subject and you've got an object. And when my story is run by my ego that is demanding because I haven't fulfilled myself through what I love, I'm fulfilling myself through this screwed up story that I'm caring about myself. So my ego is demanding that my story remain true. And I'll tell you what, we're, we're attached to our stories in a big way. And so when I'm attached to my story, it requires that my son remain screwed up because otherwise the world is messing with my story. And so... When I, it's not like I created a healthy son. All I did was set my son free from my story right. that I had screwed up somehow, so it required him as evidence. He, he was no longer required to be the evidence of anything. He got free, and my belief is when you free people up, they do great things. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We're slowly but surely coming to the top of the hour, Scout. This show goes by so fast when we get in that zone. Um, if you would, leave us with a final thought about how one can achieve love and optimism in this crazy world. You know, I think that it really, truly is learning to let go and know that life has got this and our part is to open up and let life move through us. So finding the ways to physically, I mean, we do things with our thoughts, but to physically open your body and let life move through you. So Any suggestions how we can do that? Now, this is somewhat the same question I asked you a little earlier. But some people need a piece of information that will go, oh, that's how I do it. So, you know, kind of like a little push off the cliff. They want to jump, and they get to the edge, one, two, three, and they stop, one, two, three, and they stop. Some people just need that little push. Can you offer anything yeah, that I'll, would help I'll give it. I mean, I gave that, that physicality piece before, but what I'll do now is give you a mental piece that when you find yourself triggered, pissed off, um, whatever, check in with what you're making it mean about what just happened. Mm. Check in with the assumptions you're running and, and just check and see where your mind reading, where you're projecting stories and name three different things that might be true instead of this knee jerk thing that you're assuming is true. What are your thoughts about someone telling long-winded stories? When I was getting on this path, my mentor, he would kick me in the pants. He would say, Keith, stop telling long-winded stories. I say, what do you mean? He goes, Keith, stop telling long-winded stories. And he says, I suggest you put pieces of paper all around your house where you frequent that say, stop telling stories. And I got it. It clicked. And I realized that explaining the long way around things creates a lot of... not necessary, not needed noise in the mind, because when you ask when you some when you ask someone how was your day today, you don't want them to tell you, well, I woke up, I brushed my teeth, ate some cornflakes, I walked to the car, I actually used fifty six steps to get there, and I did this. To, they just want to know how your day was. You know, I went to the store, ran a couple of errands, I had a fantastic day. That's really the, what they want to hear. It really moves me, honestly, off of my center often when people get into story. Your thoughts about getting into story and the effects it can have in one's life? Yeah, our stories matter so much less than we think they do. The only thing that really matters, (laughs) the only thing that really matters is what you made that story mean about you. Did you make it mean something powerful and positive about you, or are you making it mean something uh, derogatory or, or it's, it's, you know, some reason that you couldn't do something, you know, find the stories that empower you. And if your stories don't empower you, stop telling them, just find a different, um, it's, it really is. What are you making it mean about you? Yeah. What life are you creating presently versus buying into the, the record that's been playing in the background, the, um, just the incessant mind noise. Scout, what's coming down the pike for you, dear? 
Well, I'm uh, getting set to go up to Montana for a couple of weeks. When I come back, I'm going to be doing some more guiding here. I'm, I'm just so thrilled about what's unfolding. And what's actually happening now is my client base has shifted from people who are coming feeling like there's something to fix to people who are saying there's so much possible and I want some of that. I want some of that hojo. I want to I want to go to that mountain and hear that yes. I want to step up to that art easel and hear that yes. I want to step up to my desk in my business and feel that yes. I want to feel the yes. And but I'll tell you what, it's it just keeps getting better. I love that. I want to hear that yes. <laughs> Scout, thank you for being a phenomenal burst of light here in Center of Light Radio. You can find more about Scout at www. Scout Wilkins. Wilkins is with an I. W I L K I N S dot com. Thank you for being a bright light here. Thank you, Keith. I've so enjoyed our conversation. Keep me posting what you're doing, dear. You're always welcome. All right. Thank you. Love and light. Everyone, Scout Wilkins. What a phenomenal show. I really enjoyed her energy here. Uh, one uh, final announcement again. If you go to SoonOfLightRadio.com, the website, the opening page, you will see a subscription form. Fill it out. I had an epiphany the other day, a burst of light with my marketing manager, and I, I sobbed for an hour. She will tell you, and I pause sometimes in between writing dialogue for 10 to 15 minutes at a time because it was overwhelming. And if you fill out that form, eventually over time, I'm going to give you all of my creations for free, and we're going to do this monthly or however often I choose to do this. We're still working it out. But you sign up your name, not only will you start getting endless amounts of all everything I've created, but you always have access to my newsletter program. Yes, I have slacked off from a newsletter program for a while. I have just been so busy, but I'm about to kick that off again. Stay tuned. I, I put a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of love and joy into finding the most powerful information that I would put my wallet on the table and I say, this has to be the truth. I would bet it all because there's a feeling inside of intuition that happens when you're aligned. As Scout says, there is a yes. And when you become used to that yes, any of those little yeses, they will begin to guide you. They'll say, Keith, this way, Keith, this way, Keith, this way. And then you will take the yes into the rabbit hole. And then next thing you know, the yes that you get is all in caps. It's triple underlined. It's bold, exclamation pointed three times. And Scout is shaking her head. Yes, yes, yes. So there you have it. It's about being having the yes. Keith Anthony Blanchard here, Center of Light Radio. Tomorrow I'm going to be view, interviewing Swamji Viswayogi. I spent the last two days with God Realized Man, Swamji Viswayogi from India, putting together this new documentary I'm going to call Love, Peace, and Unity, an educational documentary about humanity's future. Hopefully next week on Center of Light Radio, I'm going to be posting to Inception Radio Network my interview tomorrow with Swamji Viswayogi titled Healing the earth by purifying the waters. Always remember when you lay down at night, you have nothing to do. Breathe, breathe, breathe until you find yourself in that deafening, profound silence. And watch what happens to your life if you do this periodically. Easing to bliss, peace, love, and light. I will see you next Monday. <laughs>